Subscribe to The Honest Critique for current affairs, movie, book, and product reviews. Also, make sure you press the bell icon to get notified whenever we upload a new video. The views, information, or opinions expressed during the video series are solely those of the individuals and do not necessarily represent those of The Honest Critique and its employees. The following video contains strong language which may be offensive to some viewers. Viewer discretion advised. So hello and welcome to a very special episode uh, we're recording today. I'm delighted to be joined by Sara Adams for the second time on our podcast. She is an intelligence. Uh, she was an intelligence analyst and a targeter with the CIA. She served as a senior advisor to the U.S. House of Representatives Select Committee on Benghazi, and was the co-author of the Benghazi Committee Report. The last time she was on our podcast, we spoke about her book Benghazi: Know Thy Enemy, a cold case investigation, which was written with Dave Benton. So, Sara, thank you so much for taking your time and speaking to us. So, uh, the context of this podcast is, of course, uh, you're trending on social media, especially after the episode with Sean Ryan's show. And uh, I counted actually uh, on the show. You mentioned India 40 times, so I guess it was the best time to have a conversation right about the subcontinent. Uh, so, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me again. So, uh, I will keep the first question a little broad, and uh, this is one question that was. trending on social media and i thought asking you about uh, the quality and the reliability of the intelligence that you are receiving about india's activity and the broader indian subcontinent if you could lay out for our audience that what are the significant trends or developments should we be aware in the region yeah the really interesting thing is you know um as you know i track libyan terrorists right obviously like a lot of terrorists they they moved back to Afghanistan right um and a lot of them are in the area of Kandahar and Kandahar is actually where the top two leaders of al qaeda's indo subcontinent are based right so i do hear a number of things regarding those senior leaders right because they're in the same circles um as my senior libyan um al qaeda members so that's kind of where i get um my knowledge as you can imagine i'm more focused on the libyans but um you know i'm curious about how they're interacting um with other terrorist groups primarily i'm curious as you can imagine of any targeting against us interests coming out of kandahar and there are a couple instances where al qaeda is using um aqis specifically one is in 2022 um al qaeda tasked aqis to do a plot against the us consulate in karachi now i had previously worked with the us consulate in karachi right so it's it's personal to me so you know that's very interesting another um interesting thing is so my key one of the key plotters of our 2012 benghazi attacks um he's based in um afghanistan and he's working on a plot in lebanon right now um with saif al adil from aq but one of the discussions they've been having is maybe we should use aqis attackers for this plot and that's not the first plot they've discussed it um there was a plot basically um against the us and the uk embassies in saudi arabia where they considered using aqis bodies and then there was separately um another plot geez it just slipped my mind oh it was against the israeli embassy in the uae so they have um considered aqis attackers and other plots so i'm obviously concerned right if the libyans involved and i want to uh, take it a little from there because uh, what we have been hearing uh, about afghanistan is something very interesting and uh, i want to start uh, straight away with something that uh, you mentioned in the interview or uh, john ryan that india is reportedly using uh, taliban's network to assassinate kashmiri militants in pakistan uh, could you expand on that particular intelligence a little bit and what are the chatters you're hearing because uh, in india whenever uh, generally any kind of attacks uh, that we happen uh, assassination uh, we hear about militants in pakistan one of the things we hear is about an unknown gunman came and shot down the militants <laughs> so uh, you you brought out in this slide that uh, those are uh, the tdp uh, militants who have been funded by uh, the indian agencies could you tell us a little bit about that yeah i actually found this accidentally um basically where it started is um a bunch of us dollars 
arrived in Africa to, um, you know, a kind of the lands of the Islamic Maghreb, so AQAM, okay? So when the U.S. dollars arrived, um, I, you know, was like, where did they come from, right? And basically, it was basically Afghanistan and then Kandahar, right? So I started trying to figure out how U.S. dollars, right, got to Afghanistan and ended up in Africa. So I was spending a lot of time on that. And obviously, the focus was those U.S. dollars are my government's dollars, right? They were my government's dollars giving to the Taliban to fight ISIS, right? And they got diverted to Al Qaeda. So while I was trying to um, get the origins of that money, I found out that, um, you know, there's this place called Gecko Base that used to be um, a base in the US government. You know, the CIA used it in the past, right? So it was very well known in my community. And while I was trying to get this information in Kandahar, I was told, hey, did you know the Indians are funding Gecko Bay? So then I was just curious, right? And I was like, is this true? And why? Because a really unique piece about Gecko Base today is it's the base where Haibatula Akunzada's personal security is based, right? So it would be kind of like, I don't know if I had a unit of Blackwater, right? That was protecting me and then a foreign government was funding them, right? So. That's kind of why I dug into it and found it interesting that they were funding the security detail for the head of the Taliban. And then when I realized, oh, it was for this ploy to go get, you know, the different terrorists involved in the Kashmiri groups. So, you know, like Alashkari Taiba, Jaishi Muhammad, um, you know, like Kuji, et cetera. It, it, it made sense when I was told, oh, no, the money was going there to help get the networks. The really interesting thing is, um, I was told the Indian government was using Taliban's networks in Pakistan to locate these terrorists. Now, the Taliban have really good networks, obviously, in Pakistan. They live there for years, but I'm not entirely sure I believe that theory. I do believe um, they also use some Harakat or Mujahideen networks, as I said, on, on the Sean Ryan show which makes a lot more sense, right? They would be able to target Kashmiri terrorists a lot better using internal Kashmiri networks. So yeah, I came across that honestly by mistake and I, I found it fascinating. As you, if you watch the China Ryan show, we just said it, it wasn't part of you know, our interview, but it came up and you know, I, it is a fascinating thing. And the reason why I mentioned this because uh, every person who watched that particular bit, I mean, of course it was just, uh, Three or four minute segments out of the <laughs> two hour fifty seven minutes interview that he recorded, yeah. uh, but it was uh, accused that, uh, and probably you could clear the air about it because it didn't come anywhere near the CIA, the information or your networks in CIA. It was your personal information that you came across. And the second thing I want to understand, and if you could uh, talk a little bit about that uh, from your chapters that you're hearing. Uh, why Taliban agreed to do that, uh, given their close network that brought them, reinstated them in power in uh, Afghanistan, especially with the Pakistani government's uh, hand in it. So why did the Taliban even agree uh, to such a deal? Yeah, so your first point is really funny, right? Because I did notice, like, so in the United States, everybody knows, right, I'm not, no longer CIA, but I noticed when the clip went viral in India, everybody thought I was some in, uh, CIA agent, and then some people thought I was a Pakistani ISI agent, and first off, they couldn't afford me. Um, but anyway, so yeah, I thought that was really funny. So as you know, from our last interview, I run my own private investigation um, into terrorists. I've been doing it for well over a decade, so I do have my own networks of information. So yeah, I asked those same questions you did. And the really interesting thing is it has shifted within the Taliban, especially if we're gonna just discuss Haibatullah Akhunzada. So Haibatullah is not at all happy with how Pakistan let the US government come in, right? And target terrorists, capture terrorists in Pakistan. Um, and Haibatullah takes it as a big slight, right? It's not the relationship that it was during the Mujahideen era. And to be honest, Haibatula really wants nothing to do with Pakistan. And he wants Pakistan to basically fall to an Islamist regime, right? He's very against the government leadership on 
you know, in Islamabad and then the Pakistani military leadership. So you have to remember, yes, all those years, Pakistan aided the Taliban. But now basically the Taliban does not need Pakistan. They did, but they don't. They, they get so much money from the U.S. government. They get money from the Iranian government. They get money from Qatar. The donations coming in from Saudi Arabia after Srajadi and Haqqani's Hajj trip are insane. Um, and then obviously there's all the business deals with China. So the Taliban don't need Pakistan and they're like, we're done with it, right? We want to now target Pakistan and that's kind of the goal there. So now setting that aside then, well, they have an issue as you can imagine because a lot of the Kashmiri terrorist groups, so let's just say Lashkari Taiba, since you, you get impacted by them a lot, right? They were kind of almost developed as a Pakistani nationalist terrorist group, right? I mean, even the training camps were run by a lot of retired Pakistani SSG, right? They're special services group. Those are special forces in Pakistan. So very close relationship between like LET and the Pakistani military. Well, that puts obviously Al Qaeda and the Taliban in a tough spot, right? Because they don't want to work with Pakistani nationalists if they want to basically take, <laughs> take down the military and kind of like make an extension of Afghanistan into Pakistan, which they want to do in Cairo Pakhtunwa you know, in Baluchistan and throughout the Fatah. So basically what it seems like their intent has been is let's make sure we ally with, we'll just say with LET because it's easiest. So LET fought with us in Afghanistan for years, right? The young guys. None of these old guys from the 90s were coming to Afghanistan and attacking U.S. bases, right? It was the young guys. So they said, hey, this next cadre, this next leadership of LET, are going to be Taliban and Al Qaeda aligned because they fought with us in Afghanistan against the Americans. We need to push the old guard out. So we have this alliance as we go into the future. And so then the Kashmiri militant groups, instead of being Pakistani aligned, will now be Taliban and Al Qaeda aligned, which makes them more usable for this global fight. I'm saying the statement that you made uh, also got a lot of attention because what happened during that period of time was uh, the Indian agencies come in a lot of flag uh, for a legit assassination attempt of two citizens, one from the US and Canada. And that added up to what you're asking. Uh, and uh, the nature in which uh, it happened, especially the number of deaths we have seen in Kashmir militants, uh, to put into context, it was basically the Indian agency was just replicating a Munich uh, in Pakistan. I wanted to uh, expand a little bit and ask you that uh, are there chatters about uh, Indian agencies uh, assassinating enemies abroad, like probably the Mossad did, or probably something of the clandestine operation, what I'll see I have done, coming more into light uh, for some reasons in uh, this day and age? Is there a reason why we see or hearing more about? Yeah, so I only heard about this kind of chain, right? Like this money went to Haiva Tula for the purpose of the Kashmiri militants. Now I'm quite aware, obviously, because, um, you know, it was all over the news, the Sikh, the Sikh assassinations, right? The, the assassination of Canada, the attempts in the United States. But I haven't come across any information where that's um, discussed. Um, so, you know, I know you could do a stretch, right? Well, if they're using the Taliban and Kashmir militant networks, right, in Pakistan, could they tap those same networks in the West, right? And it, it could be a theory you could explore, but I've no, I just don't have any background information to confirm or deny. And, and I know that's very frustrating for that community, right? Because I, I understand how, how they want answers to to why these um, assassinations and targeted assassinations are occurring and. And we saw, I mean, Trudeau and Canada was very upset that it obviously happened on Canadian soil, right? Because that does affect sovereignty, um, you know, of a nation. I'll move on from that and ask you a little bit about uh, Afghanistan uh, and the region. So how has uh, the ISIS leadership uh, shifted between the Iraq and Syria to the Afpak region, especially in the recent year, which we have seen with the boom of ISKP and especially with the Russian attack, which it has gone global? Uh, could you tell us a little bit about that? What uh, are you hearing about that? Yeah, so it's really interesting. Kind of around the kind of time of COVID, it's always an easy time frame to go off of. You know, ISIS was like, 
we're really not going to be able to keep our senior leadership and our base, right? Here in Syria and Iraq, it's just everybody was their enemy, right? Um, they're being targeted by the U.S. They're being targeted by the Russians. I mean, they just, everybody was against ISIS in the region. So they're like, we need to find a new safe haven, at least for our senior leadership. So first they considered Africa and, and that just didn't work out. So then they made the decision, hey, let's try Baluchistan in Pakistan. The reason was, you know, obviously it's in a great region, right? It has access to the sea. Also the Baluchis who live there obviously run a number of facilitation networks. They have um, national identity documents legally, right? For Iran, um, Afghanistan, um, Pakistan, et cetera. So ISIS is like, let's just kind of like seed in some families and see, um, you know, if any targeting occurs, you know, how the locals accept us, how like the Baluchistan Liberation Army works with us and supports us. And if we can merge together in some way and coexist. And so they started moving in like around 2022 in larger numbers. Um, and really the only strike against them was after, you remember when they did like the funeral service for Qasem Soleimani in January, obviously like 90 some people died. So the Iranian government did do a shot into um, where ISIS was based in Baluchistan. A lot of people thought they were targeting the old Jandala networks, but they were actually targeting ISIS, but they're kind of embarrassed that they missed them. So yeah, so then ISIS is like, okay, um, it's called Panjgor, it's in Baluchistan, they're like, this is safe. And they actually moved this senior leadership from Iraq and Syria, so the main body ISIS we think of when we think of ISIS there. Well, then when you bring up the Moscow attacks, so obviously after the Moscow attacks, it came up pretty quick, right, that it was ISIS's Khorasan province, you know, and that's run by, you know, an Afghan son of Ligafori. And he got kind of weirded out that the Russians now were after him. And so he then also left Afghanistan for Panjagur. And he based himself down in Pakistan because he thought it would be safer because no targeting was going on um, in Pakistan. So, yeah, they've been able to kind of stay under the radar there um, and kind of reestablish themselves. And they've now grown. Uh, ISIS has grown in Pakistan and Afghanistan by 30 percent in the last two years because there is nobody operationally targeting them. And this is one thing that I should have probably asked you before, but uh, let me ask you this now, that uh, what is the connection uh, between the ISIS uh, Khurasan province, the Haqqari network, and uh, the Taliban right now? So could you tell us, are they collaborating? Are they working together? Because I remember uh, in uh, the Sean Ryan show, you mentioned how uh, both the Al Qaeda network and the ISIS network somewhere uh, submerge together and work somewhere closely. Could you tell us about the whether the ISKP, the Taliban, and the Akani network are they working together or are there still differences between the groups? Sure, there's kind of like two angles to come at this, so I'm just going to do both. <laughs> so, um, ISIS and Al Qaeda started aligning actually back in 2015, mostly to deal with Libya. Okay. And now, as you can imagine, a bunch of people who fought in Libya are now in Afghanistan, right? And so they are aligned to Al-Qaeda and they're aligned to ISIS, right? Those relationships exist, right? And there needs to be a way to make those work, right? Because like in Libya, the same people run both groups. So you have that angle, okay? And remember the, the terrorist I told you who's doing the Lebanon plot? His name is Abdul Azim Ali Musa Ben Ali, okay? He's a Libyan terrorist. He was... AQIM, he was ISIS, and he is married to a Haqqani, okay? So so just, just like you, I know you understand that, so just understand that as a network. So that's one angle. Now, when you do the other angle, it goes off of Sanaula, who we just talked about. So Sanaula was the head of the Haqqani network in Kabul. So when the U.S. government was brokering this really bad Doha deal, um, Siraj Adina Khani went to Sana Ula and said, hey, th this deal is likely going to go through. I'm not going to be able to run my networks as a Khani network. I need you to embed inside ISKP so I can use ISKP when needed to carry out suicide bombings and terrorist attacks with a hidden hand so it won't be called the Haqqani network. So Sana Ula Ghaffari went into ISKP. The really interesting part is 
he wasn't in it very long and kind of became the ISKP leader for Kabul because he had such a big network in Kabul because he was running the Haqqani network there. When um, the, the head of ISKP was detained, ISKP was kind of floundering and they're like, who should be our leader? And they're like, well, we should just pick Sana Ula. Like, he has the most guys under him because he's the Kabul leadership. So pretty quickly, he became the leader of ISKP. Now, now there's two splits that Suraj Hadeen Haqqani is involved in in ISKP. So one is this one, right, with Sana Ula Ghaffari, a historic relationship. There's a whole nother one. Um, do you remember, like, so when there was ISIS in Iraq and Syria, ISIS in Syria had, like, a number two, Kalamov. He was member member Tajikistan Special Forces, very famous. You know, he left Tajikistan. He um, was a huge recruiter in Syria and, 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 like, the number two of all operations. So he works with Suraj Adin Haqqani right now in northern um, Afghanistan, and they run a completely separate cell of ISKP, who is doing a lot of the Russian targeting. So, so there are different pockets when we talk about Taliban support to ISIS, and it's on very different levels. But somewhere I want to understand uh, the ISKP's motives right now are turning out to be global from a very regional perspective that we have seen over the uh, odd a few years when the ISIS at least as a caliphate existed. Right now, it has become more vocal about global issues. And uh, could you tell us about uh, how it is actually working with some of uh, probably the militant groups that operate in the Indian subcontinent? Uh, is it collaborating with any of the groups in the Indian subcontinent? Yeah, so, you know, I'm not as strong in ISIS. So ISIS has always been global, right? It's just the really interesting part is when ISIS is in a region, they give themselves a new name, right? So there's like nine or 10 ISISs. It's all ISIS, but when they go to another region, it's in Africa, I think there's like four or five of them, right? But ISIS has continually done international attacks. It's just they obviously got beat down in Iraq and Syria, lost a lot of funding. Obviously, the fall of Kabul has given them a resurgence, right? They are able to train again, recruit again. Um, they get some funding from Al Qaeda. They get some weapons from Al Qaeda. They obviously have a little, this top cover from the Haqqanis, right? So they have a freedom to grow and expand. Um, and then, like I said, if we just focus on the old ISIS Syria guys, a lot of them are falling back and joining the Khorasan province part. So these are very well trained terrorists. They're very good at recruiting because they're famous, right? They're very famous within, you know, kind of Islamic circles um, in Syria. And, and this is why we're seeing this massive growth. And it's because they want revenge, right? The, these guys who fought in Syria, right? They, they, they got it hard, right? From Russia, from America, right? They want to go after these countries who, who killed kind of all their, their, their fighting terrorist brothers. So when it comes to India, I have very little information. One of the things I do know is uh, some of the same facilitation networks move fighters, weapons, and then like um, kind of like explosives to India within its like the AQIS networks and the ISIS networks. Some of them actually work with both groups. And I think a lot of people get confused by that, but some of the movements into India, it, it like some of the facilitators are fine working with AQIS and they're fine working with ISIS. Another really interesting thing, and I brought this up briefly, I think on the Shandran show, but maybe a different one, and then a lot of people don't understand it, is so there is kind of this migration of Indians, right? And they're coming to the U.S. southern border. So the majority, as you can imagine, are coming for economic opportunities. But ISIS is getting on those planes with them, right? Some of the funding is coming from terrorist groups because it's an expensive move, right? private planes, um, you know, one of the, the routes, you know, leaves India, goes to Benghazi of all places, then goes to Nicaragua. Very expensive private planes, right? So that's not being funded by um, poor Indians, right, who want to come to America. It's being funded by terrorist groups. And there's a number of terrorists on those planes. And um, that's concerning. And so ISIS is traveling in kind of among, you know, the, the, this refugee or migrant population trying to come in. And so that's very dangerous for my country. I mean, obviously, just all the routes into India is a problem for your country, right? I mean, because there, there's routes, obviously, in through Kashmir, there's sea routes, right? So AQIS has a, a 
like some are running the court in Goa, right? So they can bring stuff in um, and, and no one checks it, right? So there's um, a whole recruitment pipeline from Pakistanis Punjab, you know, in, in, in India. And then throughout India, um, ISIS is really, I mean, Al Qaeda in, in the subcontinent has really done a good job of taking like the anti Muslim policies of, you know, the Prime Minister Modi and the recruiting off of it. But the really interesting thing, it's not like the recruitment we're exactly used to it's almost like to the old days they're doing recruitment rings so they're using kind of like um religious leaders etc in communities and pulling people into aqis so it's a very smart way to do it on the community level it's easier to vet people right um but that's how they're kind of pulling it in the interesting part is though right now when we talk just about you know, al-Qaeda in the subcontinent, most of their people are in Afghanistan. There's thousands of them in Afghanistan. There's 3,000 in Pakistan, and then there's 1,000 in India. So still, the AQIS threat is to Pakistan right now. And then in the future, it's to India, which is interesting, because remember, the leader of AQIS was TTP. <laughs> so right now, AQIS's main focus is they're supporting TTP's um, fight against the Pakistani army in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa and in Balochistan, right? Because they want to also weaken Pakistan for when then they move on um, to India. So it's very interesting. A lot of people think, oh, they're all in India. And that's just not true at all. Most are not in India. A lot of people were using TikToks uh, as the migration route, but in India, TikTok is banned. So how are these people actually communicating uh, either with the commanders to travel or what are they uh, ch chatting on actually if you could uh, have any information and you can talk about that yeah i don't exactly know um you know i've had some discussions on like the different planes and routes people were taking but i don't actually know what they did at the recruitment level in india to get people on the plane but the interesting part is um TikTok is primarily being used as the route up. So you know how I said the Indians, at least the ones you know I've been looking at because they fly through Benghazi, Libya, they would land in Nicaragua, okay? So now the, the planes have about 400 people, okay? So when you land in Nicaragua, then you can use TikTok. And basically what it does is it tells you, take this road, don't go this way, police are this way. If you need medical assistance, go here. If you need food, water, shelter, go here. And it helps to safely move you to the southern border. Then when you get to the southern border, it says cross here, go here at this time. There's no staffing at this location. And it just helps people infiltrate into the United States. So I think it's less important on the local level. I think the local level, like in India, is what I'm saying, those recruitment networks, et cetera, the, the terrorist um, networks and the f funding. And even, it's not an India thing, right? I mean, these terrorists are traveling from Iran. I mean, the most are traveling from Turkey, right? So it's, it's a small number of like ISIS terrorists coming out of India. That's not the problem, but, but these terrorist networks are moving in whoever they can <laughs> to my country. And that's where it's a problem. I don't care what their nationality is, right? If they're ISIS or Al Qaeda, I don't want them here. And I want to ask two questions uh, from here. And uh, these are all speculations that we have been hearing. And I wanted to ask you that a lot of uh, experts have been mentioning of how the ISI has been in conversation with ISKP in some sort of a way uh, to neutralize some of their own threats. Uh, is that true? Is uh, uh, the ISKP is in conversation with the I Pakistani intelligence services uh, in some sort of a way? That's one thing I want to understand. And second thing is, you know, when the Taliban uh, took over Afghanistan, one of the major uh, concerns for the Indian government has always been uh, the foreign fighters that might uh, emerge or even the American weapons that was left behind coming to the Kashmir theater. Uh, and one of the groups probably we haven't spoken about is the Jaish e Mohammed. We have spoken about the Lashkar Taiba. And uh, in the Western world as well, we have seen uh, Jaish e Mohammed has not been much in conversation as Lashkar Taiba has been. But uh, the Jaish has been using a lot of the Taliban uh, and the Al Qaeda uh, training camps as well for their own training. Could you t tell us uh, is that the same case right now after the Taliban took over? Okay, yeah. So let me try to remember everything in order. So I haven't spent tons of time tracking on um, ISI's relationships, but what I do know is um, 
So Pakistan is having, so Pakistan for many years brought in all these U.S. counterterrorism dollars, apparently all the money that goes to the Taliban now. And so Pakistan isn't getting that level of money from the U.S. government anymore in this war with whomever it is, TTP, but supplemented by the Taliban and Al-Qaeda, et cetera. It's costing Pakistan a lot of money, first off. So if we just look at the economics, so one of the things I've been told is Pakistan engaged with ISIS basically to help bring black market oil up, right, to offset oil prices and take advantage of it. Another thing is when we talk about, remember how I talked about how the two of Akhenzada is like, we don't trust Pakistan anymore. So Pakistan is kind of to a point where they lost a lot of um, influence and allies in the region. So we, like I said, ISIS senior leadership is based in Pakistan. ISKP's largest training here is based in Pakistan, right? And Pakistan isn't striking any of them. So Pakistan seems to be trying to use ISKP as a lever, right? Assuming in this case, it's a lever against the, the, the Taliban, which I think they didn't expect to happen. So yeah, it is a very dangerous game Pakistan is playing. And then kind of the last piece I know of, when I talk about that, the largest ISKP training camp that is in Pakistan it is actually on a frontier core military base in Iraq side. So you can't say you have no um, alignment, right, with ISKP when on the map, their training camp is on a military base, right? Um, so, you know, that's one of the things I brought up the Sean Ryan show, because at least when I lived in Islamabad, the frontier core guarded the diplomatic enclave and the Indian embassy is actually just south of our embassy, it's maybe like a building or two on the diplomatic enclave. So even the Indian embassy has frontier corps, at least they did when I served there, outside of it. Very dangerous, right? If they might have a direct relationship with uh, ISKP. So that's kind of like the bit I know in Pakistan, just because I'm not spending time in Pakistan because my Libyans are in Afghanistan, right? Unfortunately. So it's just something I'm not getting a lot of info on. And then the second question you asked, so yeah, so the really interesting part is, say, Jaisi Muhammad has a lot going on. Um, the thing is, like everything, I don't actually collect on it, but I know, for example, like just in Nangahar province, um, Jaisi Muhammad has three, two or three, I'm trying to think, three terrorist training camps, their own terrorist training camps. Now, like you said, those are terrorist training camps that are Jaish and Muhammad, but of course they're they're basically housed by the Taliban, right? So the Taliban for the training camp, no matter which group it is, but this time we'll say for Jem. So what the Taliban does is they secure the location, right? They guard the outside of your camp. They help vet the terrorists coming to your camp, right? In a lot of cases, they provide um, the weapons, the trainers even, etc for you to operate your camp right they try to make it like a really good opportunity for you to operate your camp there the other really interesting thing is they also want you to base yourself in afghanistan so a really good example so so how they would do it with jam is they would say hey jam did you have fighters of the last 20 years who died fighting in Afghanistan against Americans? Of course they did, right? So then basically what happens is Sirajid Haqqani, who runs the Ministry of Interior, sets up like a welfare payment, okay? So I know the cost of the AQIS one. So the AQIS one, you know, you get $1,000 a month, U.S. dollars, and you get like agricultural land. And you can move your family to Afghanistan and they basically live under a welfare and kind of develop the land. And, you know, for a thousand dollars a month, you don't have to work. So you can come and live a really good life in Afghanistan as a terrorist and as a terrorist family. And that brings a lot more of these foreign terrorists in, right? Because their families now kind of get houses and get cars and they get to live in a society where they're not hiding, where, where they're not wanted, right? And that is something that the Taliban is doing to bring people like Jem in there to establish their training camps inside of Afghanistan. You mentioned there are three training camps for Jesh, uh, out of which are there any camps in which suicide bombing has been taught? Because the last time the biggest attack by Jesh, that was the Pulwama in 2019, it was a suicide bomber. So are there suicide bombing training being given in one of the camps? 
I'd have to check on those three camps, but there are eight camps in Afghanistan affiliated with um, Al Qaeda's allies, which is include GEM, where you can undergo suicide training. So a GEM member can go to those eight camps and get the training, no matter if it's a GEM run camp or not, because it's Al Qaeda. I'll have a couple of more questions on India and I go to Afghanistan a little bit in detail. So uh, you haven't touched upon, of course, uh, in the Sean Ryan show about the sleeper cells in the Indian subcontinent. And uh, of course, for obvious reasons, because it was catering to the US audience. But I wanted to understand that, do you have any information about AQIS or ISKP uh, having sleeper cells in India? Well, like I said, I do know um, AQIS has 1,000 members approximately right now in India. Um, the negative is, you know, the, the plots I have collected on, um, none of them have been a plot against India. I'm not saying there's none being planned, but, you know, I mentioned the ones I know, but like I said, I, most people share with me, right, if it's a U.S. embassy or U.S. consulate, because I'm like the Benghazi girl. Um, so I just have not um, come across or collected any. So it doesn't mean that me not saying it doesn't mean there aren't any. I just don't have the information, right? So I can't just project something that I just don't have facts on. And moving from that, I want to ask you a few more questions on Afghanistan. And the, the, when the Taliban came to power, one of the first thing that they promised was that it, they will clean uh, the entire Afghanistan and not allow uh, terrorist, any of the terrorist organizations to function. And that was the first, I remember, uh, spe- uh, con- uh, conferences, when the press conference happened, that was the first thing that was mentioned. Uh, could you discuss uh, the current status of uh, the training camps or probably Al-Qaeda's presence in operation in Afghanistan? And did the Taliban meet the promise in 2024 right now? Yeah, so there's been no enforcement of this Doha peace deal, as people call it, right? Um, yeah, the main promise by um, the Taliban is they wouldn't allow Al-Qaeda to be there. I, I think they meet some objectives of it by sharing little details here and there about certain al-qaeda members in afghanistan as you can imagine it's nothing to curb on the growth of al-qaeda in afghanistan it's surely not affecting any targeting right zawahiri was the only terrorist taken out in the last three years so yeah al-qaeda has expanded um rapidly i mean we talked about the three jaishi muhammad camps but when you talk about al-qaeda and its affiliated groups right now I know of 42 terrorist training camps um, in Afghanistan, and that's just Al Qaeda's affiliates. That's not even counting IS- ISIS, ISKP related, and it's not counting um, the Quds Force has a couple of camps kind of down in the south. So there's over 50 terrorist training camps in Afghanistan. You know, Al Qaeda alone has grown over 50,000 new trained fighters. And as a lot of people know, even just the Taliban army has grown over 200,000 new recruits, right? So the, the numbers are staggering, right? AQIS has grown by thousands. They never would have had that opportunity, right? So yeah, the, the to say you don't have terrorists come and then Saifal Lada makes a public statement Oh, all terrorists, come to Afghanistan, come settle here, bring your wife and kids, right? Um, And then, like I told you, they're paying welfare to these families. So, like, my Libyans in Afghanistan, right, they're paid by by the Ministry of Interior, right? They get a salary, right? They get paid to be terrorists in Afghanistan, and they're not Afghan. That money isn't going to normal Afghans who can't even put food on their table. A lot of them can't even work under the Taliban regime due to their alliances with western governments in the past right so yeah they have become totally a terrorist supporting state and doing nothing for their own people yeah and the narco trade which was the first uh line of uh revenue that the taliban utilized when the u.s was in Tali- uh, when u.s was in afghanistan the taliban has been using the same route to get revenues especially since Domestically, it's not very convenient for them to get revenues. Is that narco-terrorism still continuing in Afghanistan? Oh, yeah. Narco-terrorism is still very large. So what the Taliban did is really smart. 
they basically first like kind of stopped for a very short period of time the opium trade so the prices would skyrocket then they focus all the production into two regions in um afghanistan so it's helmet and badakhshan so basically before you know random people ran their own opm right there were small farmers right um it was an enterprising thing and so taliban took all control of it and taliban now makes all the funds from it right so yeah it, it's a huge problem um you know, and the drugs are moving all over. I mean, the heroin being, for example, uh, moved to Australia, right? So for anyone to say this trade is done, they're, they're being dishonest. And uh, this is something interesting, which I actually picked up on the Sean Ryan show. And by the way, of course, the Indian part, which I was, we had a conversation, of course, was shocking. But what was shocking more for me in the conversation was uh, the Palestinian terrorist uh, who... Uh, like war involved in the October 7 attacks did have the training in Afghanistan and uh, I actually cover uh, Israel for a lot of Indian newspapers and one of the podcasts I do is about Israel so we have a significant Israeli population who watches the show and I want to take a minute or two to understand about the information that you had about the Palestinian groups being trained in Afghanistan and how much of Iran uh, backing that they had could you expand on that a little bit Sure. I don't know how strong the Iran backing of the training was, but I do know a lot about the training. So the interesting part is, from what I know, Hamas came to at least three training locations um, in Afghanistan. One was in Helmand, one was in Tarankot, and one was in Kandahar. Okay, so this would be like spring to summer um, 2023 before the attacks. Um, the primary training I know of, um, at least, is urban warfare. Um, I'm interested in that training program because it's actually run by three Libyans. <laughs> um, and I'm also interested, right, concerned that they're going to train the U.S. homeland attackers. So obviously, I want to know the tactics, um, what's involved. So basically, that's the training Hamas came through. And then also, while Hamas was training... In Afghanistan, Abu Ubeda, the spokesperson, actually came to oversee the training to thank both Taliban and Al-Qaeda. So basically, you know, Taliban hosts these fighters, but they were trained by Al-Qaeda trainers, right? So so that's really important to understand. Um, the other part is, is so Iran, the Quds Force, gives money to these camps just in general, right? They support um, the camps. They have a historic relationship. Remember, like, Iran is the one who um, housed Sayyaf al right? So a lot of people went to Pakistan, Osama bin Laden, of course, is the best example. But then some people hid in Iran. And so the, the head of basic external operations right now for the Al-Qaeda, he was based in Iran. The Libyan terrorists I told you about, he was based in Iran. That was who was supporting him until... They moved into Afghanistan in 2022. So these are very long historic networks. And their relationship was with first Soleimani, right? And now his replacement, you know? So these are top level Quds Force relationships. So it's very strange when people don't actually say Al Qaeda or Taliban have these relationships with Quds Force because they have very close historic ongoing relationships. And as I mentioned on the Sean Ryan show, um, in December, um, after the attacks, um, Mua um, Berater and then Saif al Adel, who we just talked about, traveled to meet the Quds Force in Iran. They requested they come, and the discussion was, how can we further help support Hamas? And basically, what the Quds Force told them is, what we need you to do is send trainees from uh, al-Qaeda camps to Iraq and Syria to um, basically keep U.S. forces busy to um, kind of, you know, go after Israeli interests, right? So to supplement, you know, um, the, the activities but out of um, Iraq and Syria. And so they've been sending fighters um, per that request ever since. So, you know, newly trained attackers. And so it's really interesting, too. So these newly trained terrorists get to go to Iraq and Syria, right? And they're, it's almost like a training ground, but it's real life. And so it's going to make them also more operationally viable when they come back and then they go on to attack in other places, you know. Okay. Wow, that's a lot of information that you uh, gave. And I want to have 
a couple of questions from here and the first thing i want to ask you is uh why did the palestinian groups even choose uh, to travel all the way down to afghanistan uh, for terror camps of course there are other training camps probably they could have found in the sahel region itself and they didn't have to travel all the way to afghanistan that's one and the second thing is you mentioned that it's in the late 2022 2023 the training happened and it was october 2023 that the attacks actually took place uh in short what the hell was the other intelligence agency has been doing uh, couldn't they catch carry on some chatter at least uh, that a group from uh, the north i mean from gaza strip traveled to afghanistan and went to gaza strip to carry out the attacks yeah so i wondered about the training too um basically There is multiple theories. One is it was the best place to get the urban warfare training. Is that true or not? I don't know, right? Um, but um that is one of the reasons they went for the specific training. Um and then two was there was no fear the camps would be hit because there was no targeting at the time, right? So if they went to a camp in another region, maybe Israel or somebody was watching it and might strike it. Israel was not, of course, doing strikes in Afghanistan. The US wasn't doing strikes in Afghanistan. And until that time, Pakistan hadn't done any strikes in Afghanistan, right? So they really it was a safe area to train. But yeah, like you said, it's not just fighters who moved into Afghanistan and back out, but weapons moved out of Afghanistan to um Gaza as well from Afghanistan. So yeah, this was a complete failure of intelligence, but remember, with the fall of Kabul, there's statistics that like western governments lost 95% of their counterterrorism reporting. And then as you know, our ally now is the Taliban. So you got to rely on the Taliban to give you factual terrorism reporting. So yeah, I don't think the collection was there. I don't think they had a bunch of pieces and couldn't put together like 9/11. I think they didn't even collect it at all. And I want to move a little bit uh, into the details about Afghanistan. Uh, probably one last question that I want to ask you uh, is that uh, how has the situation uh, changed uh, for former US allies in Afghanistan since the withdrawal? If you could summarize a little bit about that, uh, is it? a procedure in terms of probably we have seen the number of terror attacks come down probably because the ones who are carrying out the attacks are itself them in power uh but how is the situation right now yeah so the really interesting thing is because Taliban is the government they aren't considered terrorists anymore so when they count terrorist attacks in Afghanistan it's only if ISIS does something so nothing the Taliban does is counted as a terrorist attack. It's the same exact thing that happens in Syria, right? The Syrian government is basically terrorist against their own people, but because they're the government, those attacks don't get counted and they only count the terrorists. So you get a really skewed number, right? So now Afghanistan was really high on the list of terrorist attacks in the world, now it's like fifth or sixth, but it's not a factual number, right? And when you in terms of allies, I mean the allies are in a very tough situation as you can imagine. Their biometrics are given to the Taliban, so you can't just go undercover now and say, "Oh, I'm not that guy. I'm Mohammed Khan." And they just stick your fingerprint on something and say, "No, you know, you're you're this guy." So there is no way to hide in Afghanistan because of the biometric problem. So a lot of um, you know U.S. allies are in hiding, or as you know, they fled to Pakistan. They fled to um, Iran or the two closest easiest locations they got to but they're living in very difficult situations in those countries and then there's plenty still undergoing torture in Afghanistan and even the Taliban have this ploy I don't know if it hit the press over in India but so the CIA had these kind of like counterterrorism units um post protection um like forces and what the Taliban have done so a lot of them got out right when the uh, evacuations occurred but you know it's been 3 years now and their families still haven't been evacuated like their wives and children so what the Taliban has been doing it's been doing ploys right like we're going to marry your 8 year old daughter off to a Taliban commander or whatever right and so the men are coming back and then they're getting locked up too um and tortured and at this point remember they live in America now so we have while we have three blue us passport holders detained you know we have hundreds of people who have homes in america and they're currently being tortured and detained by the taliban it's a huge problem and it's going to continue to be a huge problem as long as my government ignores it's occurring 
So, what are the current gaps then when we are looking at Afghanistan? Because, uh, of course, we, I, I would I like to believe, and what I have been seeing is that we might have a lot of less conversation around Afghanistan for sure. Uh, the amount of conversation which we used to have, uh, the period when US was there, of course, which much more than what we have right now. But uh, what the information you're giving about the training camps, about uh, the Palestinian groups being trained in Afghanistan and what's uh, happening, what's the gap for the intelligence agencies or for other academics to come out with those same uh, level of analysis? Yeah, it's really interesting because, you know, Afghanistan had a free press, right? Like India has a free press. Well, that doesn't exist anymore, right? So you get a tailored message out of Afghanistan or someone trying to put out correct information, obviously gets kidnapped in their home and they go missing. We don't know what happened to them, right? So getting factual information of Afghanistan is very difficult. So like you're kind of alluding to, normal people aren't going to have good info. Like intelligence agencies have to rebuild source networks and get the factual information and share it, unfortunately. Um, you know, even like, just regular Afghan sharing stuff, it's very, very complicated, you know? So so I've had multiple situations where the Taliban came to our house and killed a family member, okay? And so basically what the Taliban does is they say, if you tell an American, and if we find out if that gets out, right, in the press or something, we'll come back and kill the entire family, right? So there's plenty of us who know a lot more. I share probably 10% of what I know is going on in Afghanistan because it's going to get key people killed to talk about it. And that's what happens when you live under terrorists, right? They control everything. And there's a looming threat at all times, you know, that they can end you for saying or doing anything. And it's just a really difficult situation. And it's on world governments to do something about it, right? Because the, the Afghan people are now under a terrorist regime funded by all these world governments. And as long as that money still goes in, it, it keeps that terrorist group powerful and it pe keeps the people weak under them. So how are you getting the information actually about the camps? Uh, I'm not asking you to reveal your sources, but if you could point us how you are exactly getting the information about this, uh, probably the camps, about the terror activities. Yeah, I mean, I get it from a number of ways. Um, obviously, there's a resistance in Pakistan, and the resistance does put out in some put out intelligence. So um, the group run by Sami Sadat, they'll put out some intelligence on ISIS, and they'll put some intelligence on AQ and even AQIS. So they're at least one of the resistance groups that are trying to share it publicly so the public can see it. Um, the National Resistance Front shares some. I think one of the biggest people to share information is the old vice president of Afghanistan, um, Saleh, Amrullah um, Saleh. He actually basically leaks a bunch of stuff from the Taliban government, right? So there are some people trying to forward put it out to the public. But again, you know, it puts them in um, precarious situations, and especially their family members who are still based, um, of course, in Afghanistan and, and their movements, right? Um, Obviously, these anti-Taliban resistance movements aren't getting a lot of Western support. So one of the reasons they do is they want to share, hey, we have a big problem here. This isn't an Afghanistan problem, right? This is a world problem. Like, the head of al-Shabaab is based in Kandahar. Like, that's a problem. That's a Somali terrorist group, right? Um, so a lot of countries are being impacted by this giant um, training infrastructure. And I want to play the devil's advocate and ask you this question that, uh, I mean, a lot of the networks and sources that we, especially the Western countries, uh, US have left in Afghanistan, uh, some of them uh, might want to share information out of the need that they want to move out of Afghanistan themselves and they want uh, probably some kind of asylum in exchange of information. Uh, and when uh, probably you're vulnerable to give information like that, how much of that information is reliable or accurate? And especially, I want to understand from you because uh, some of the information that you're getting is directly from your sources. And it's very difficult to verify some of the information because it's a closed country right now. Yeah, I mean, the way I look at it is anytime a terrorist group runs a country, you have to be curious of any information right especially in my situation i mean the taliban know who i am so obviously i can't take information from some random person who reaches out to me because it could probably be the gdi which is taliban's 
intelligence agency, right? Just giving me crap, right? Um, so yeah, the really interesting part is I don't offer, so my networks are old and established, but I don't offer any sort of promises of evacuation for information. First off, that's a choice of the US government, right? And we saw how many people they left behind. Um, so the sad part is a lot of people won't share stuff with the US government now, or even Americans, because they feel, um, neglected it actually is a really good time for foreign governments to go recruit in afghanistan right because they feel sh shaded by the u.s government they don't feel like they can trust them and then there's the whole other issue if i give this information to the u.s government because they have an information sharing relationship with the taliban will they give it to the taliban will i end up dead right so yeah getting information in afghanistan is very difficult you have to rebuild trust if you didn't already have it, of course. And, you know, like you said, anything can be influenced by the terrorists. I feel like a large percentage of stuff going to the U.S. government's intelligence community is influenced by the Taliban. It has long been influenced by the Taliban, right? We had a substance wrong with the Taliban for 20 years. That's because they seeded that information in, right? There's probably plenty of double agents. This has been going on a very, very long time. And... Uh we're looking at uh, 2022 onwards, we have seen uh, this new generation of Taliban and which they would like to call themselves. And I'm sure that all the analysts who have been looking at it, we have seen not much of a difference exists between the Taliban 1.1, 2.0. Uh, but uh, you have spoken about something called the second generation terrorist and uh, uh, the Taliban terrorists. I want to understand, is there a difference that the new generation of terrorists that are coming up in Afghanistan from the ones that we have seen in the late 90s? The interesting part in Afghanistan, the second generation is still the same family. So I find that really interesting. One of the things I've noticed that changed is in the past, Al Qaeda wasn't as trusting as the Taliban, right? They put things into special programs. I think the most famous being like um, back in Tarnic Farms, right? It was their old WMD program, right? And they're like, we don't have Afghans in this program. We don't have Taliban in this program. And now Al Qaeda still isn't the most trusting, but they're getting more comfortable, right? Doing things jointly with the Taliban. So that's very different, right? Because, you know, 9 11, Mullah Omar said, hey, I really didn't know this was coming. And that likely is factual, right? Now, for the, the U.S. homeland attack, you know, I get to life and Zara, we're all going to be told at least the day before it happens, right? So it is a closer relationship the other part is it's based on um continuing the bloodlines which is very interesting they've made this a new focus so like a year ago now al Qaeda in libya they kind of did like a restructuring um and they made kind of one whole pillar hey we need to focus on these historic relationships keeping them built keeping this connection back to afghanistan and the thing that's happening in Afghanistan, which is interesting, every senior Al Qaeda leader must take like a mentee on and mentor them. Because remember, in the past, the US would strike the terrorists, right? And they would have to keep changing out external operational leaders. And by the time they got to like the fifth or sixth, they weren't very good, right? So, so Al Qaeda is like, we want to make sure we have leaders to go forward in the future. We want to make sure these leaders come from historic families. And then even the families of terrorists who have died, they've reached out to them and said, come back to Afghanistan. We will bring your kids through these programs. We will let your kids learn what your husband did and honor his service. And so, yeah, it's very interesting that they're a lot more focused on how to preserve themselves in the future because they didn't do as well um, back, you know, in, in 2001 and weren't as prepared for the continuation of Al-Qaeda. But does uh, any of these groups uh, still have a broader global ambition and the security threat that existed uh, around 2000-2001 uh, period before 9-11 still looms larger? Uh, or is it more localized? There are more probably local ambitions. No, they, they still want a global Islamic caliphate. That hasn't changed. Now, there is a new um, initiative. I don't know much about it. So basically back, you know, when, um, the, when Gaddafi was beginning to fall, like before Bin Laden's death, he had had this idea of a global Islamic army, Let's all come together and defeat who we need to defeat, right? In that case, it was a 
the leader of a Muslim country not being, you know, Sharia law and whatnot, right? Um, and so he had an Islamic army plan he was going to set up in Libya. It didn't exactly happen. He died a few years later. They tried it. It was quite successful. Anyway, it doesn't exist anymore in Libya. Well, that Islamic army idea has taken some root. So it's based in coast, like I said, I don't know details of it, but it basically has some sort of government structure, right? It's not a, it's not exactly Al Qaeda. It's going to be the groups all come together, right? They all kind of report together across the Shura. It's an umbrella organization. It's kind of like a big TTP, right? Because when TTP was formed in 2007, right? It was like, hey, we're better to stronger. So Abdullah Masood, Baitullah Masood, Fakir Muhammad were like, yeah, we don't all get along well, but we still will be better if we all become a group to take it to, you know, the Pakistani army. So it's kind of that idea, like, how can we bring in, and it even includes um, the Shia groups, you know, like, like the Hezbollah and Hamas, like, how do we work on a global scale and support each other globally? Because we all have the same goal of this global caliphate, right? We don't all just want our one location and actually al qaeda has shifted then al qaeda now is no longer focused on gaining territory they want the concept of full governance right so obviously how the taliban took over afghanistan they want basically that to occur in mali they want it to occur in libya they want it to occur in syria and iraq when we pull out so they have some initial goals like we want to take the full government and the full country vice oh we have this plot of land that we fight over and people bomb us on they they don't care about that anymore and lastly this is the last question that i have and probably uh my friend can take over because she had to ask you some questions so i'll keep the last question as uh one of the things that has happened uh, in the last a few years has been uh the internet penetration in the subcontinent and we've seen more people getting access to a smartphone to the internet and that has uh, offshooted recruitment by terror groups as well. Uh, of course, I'm not going to ask you how much of that will impact global terrorism. We have seen what happened with the ISIS and the Caliphate. But how much of you see that impact in the Indian subcontinent, especially if you could talk a little bit about that? I'm not sure how I see it in the Indian subcontinent because I don't obviously focus on that. But terrorism has become mainstream, right? When it used to first be on the internet, it would be blocked right away or you had to find some weird site on the dark web. Remember that? Or there'd be these weird social network groups and then you'd have to dig around for the terrorist content. Now, like you can pull up anything on Telegram. Facebook has an insane amount of terrorism content. Obviously, Twitter, you know, I mean, um, most of the terrorists can, can stay and keep their accounts on Twitter, right? Um, TikTok has a lot of terrorism content. So it's mainstream now, which is even worse, right? Because you might not know your kids are being indoctrinated, right? Like, who would worry about their kid on Facebook? That even just sounds like an old person's group, right? So, so the really interesting thing is even the terrorist groups are doing, so ISIS is doing this funny thing even on Facebook. So their posts aren't getting taken down because they're putting like these in, emoticons all over it so they'll put a video or a picture and it's like a guy killing someone and then they'll put 10 smiley faces and that gets by the facebook censors and doesn't come down so yeah like they're just terrorist groups are mainstream now so to be honest i think any kind of parent or whatnot should be very focused on their kids social media because all you have to do is click one item. It's crazy, right? You you saw something, you know, like, oh no, I shouldn't have watched this. And then you get all the algorithms send you a thousand more things like that, right? It's almost made to enable terrorism. I know it's not to do that. It's to enable advertising and all these other issues, but it actually supports the terrorist groups who are on these sites. But it has the Gaza war that you have seen, especially with those images, uh, imageries that you see around uh, like houses being destroyed and uh, probably is that offshooting a lot of this uh, like terror recruitment in the subcontinent I, I mean i would of course ask you globally but uh, since most of our viewers in subcontinent so i'll just ask you is that helping the cause of terrorists 
it definitely helps to cause a terrorist. And then it also promotes misinformation, right? I mean, a lot of those videos are Syria, right? Which is sad. It's still sad it happened there, right? Uh, so a lot of videos and information coming out isn't even factual, right? So just being able to disseminate terrorist messaging is dangerous, right? And it gets people's emotions in, in, involved. And sometimes when you get down a path of, let's say, a conspiracy or a belief, right, you're now almost like an activist, right? And it's harder than to kind of like walk back and say, hey, you got to see both sides of this, or hey, this was misinformation that came at you. The younger generation view, like their news is on these social media sites. They don't read, you know, I don't know, the New Delhi Times or whatever the newspapers are called anymore. Um, you know, they are getting these little blurbs of information and a lot of it is misinformation on, um, and then they don't get any kind of follow-up that it was. So yeah, it's, in, in the U.S., it's spurred recruitment, you know, dramatically to where, you know, I think the majority of Americans have always been, you know, pro- the safety and security of the Palestinian people. That's why we've always allocated funds to them, right? Humanitarian dollars. But to watch like people in America like carrying Hamas flags and putting Hamas headbands on, like that is a level that you wouldn't even expect to see um, in a country like America. Now go other places where misinformation occurs more, where maybe people, there's populations less educated. And it's a lot easier to recruit um, people in those environments. So that's all the questions that I had, Sarah. Thank you so much for Thank taking you. your time and speaking. Uh, but uh, before I let you go, why did you choose to do this, actually? Uh, because you haven't spoken to any of the Indian press, so I was surprised that you agreed to do this. Well, I have a relationship with you guys. So, I mean, maybe some people reached out to me. I get thousands of messages and I rarely get through them. So people probably like, that girl never reads her DMs. I just don't have time. So luckily we had an established relationship. So thank you so much for doing this. And for everyone thank who you. wants to check out Sarah's work, I'll link uh, the description to your book, uh, Benghazi Know Thy Enemy. And you can check out other episodes that you've recorded with Sarah. So thank you once again for taking your time and speaking. Thank you.